All right, thank you everyone for coming to another edition of the high energy uh, division talks at the CFA remote in the era of the pandemic. Our first speaker is Mojgan Azadi. Uh, Mojgan is originally from Iran. She got her master's degree from the University of Tehran in Iran on general relativity. Here in the US, she switched her field to observational astronomy and got her PhD from UC San Diego in 2017. She worked with Allison Coyle on multi-wavelength identification of AGN. She started her postdoc at, here at the CFA in 2017 and has been working with Belinda Wilkes on multi-wavelength analysis of the 3CR AGN since then. Uh, Mojkan, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here and giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. My research is focused on supermassive supermassive black holes and active galaxies. Here at CFA, I've been working with Linda Wilkes on multi-wavelength analysis of radio loud AGN. Um, today, I will be presenting a recent paper on disentangling the AGN and the star formation contributions to the radio to X-ray emission of radio loud AGN. My main collaborators at CFA are the members of the 3CR team, Joanna Kurashkovic, Matt Ashby, Steve Wilner, Jonathan McDowell, Grant Trembley and the students in our group, Soleil Hyman and Natasha Abrams. I'm very excited to share the results of this paper with you. Uh, we know that the center of almost every large galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole with a mass of 10 to the five to 10 to the 10 solar mass. There are various structures around the supermassive black hole in, in an AGN. And one of them is, a, is the accretion disk. This strong gravitational force from the supermassive black hole drags the nearby material and in a standard picture form a rotating gaseous disk called the accretion disk shown in blue here. On the accretion disk, the temperature and the optical depth of the gas are inversely related to the distance from the supermassive black hole. The temperature gradient result in an energy gradient in emission. So the hard X-ray emission comes from the corona in the innermost region of the disk and the UV and visible um, photons come from the outer region of the disk. There is also another, of, of, there is also an obscuring the structure of material that surrounds the black hole and the accretion disk known as the torus shown in the pink red here. Some of the UV and optical photons coming from the accretion disk get absorbed by the dust grains in the torus and will be reprocessed and re-radiated at longer wavelengths such as mid infrared. The distribution of dust in the torus has been subject of many studies. Earlier studies proposed homogeneous, a homogeneous structure in which the dust is smoothly distributed in a toroidal disk. Then the studies moved towards clumpy models. Recent studies find that models which combine both features can successfully reproduce the media IR spectra of AGN. The accretion process can sometimes form huge jets of a strong magnetic field emanating out from around the black hole. Um, these radio jets can grow into enormous sizes, sometimes extending far beyond the host galaxy. But not every AGN can produce such a strong jets. In fact, only about 10 to 15% of AGN population are able to launch such structures. So today I specifically want to talk about this population, the radio loud agent. In my recent paper, I considered a subset of agent from the revised third, Cam third Cambridge catalog of radio sources or 3CR. So the parent sample from my study was the 3CR and my sample is a subsample of it, which we call 3CRR. As you can see, astronomers are not very creative in coming up with names. These sources are at redshift of one to two. Um, this sample, which is a complete sample, includes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 38 radio galaxies, <coughs> excuse me, including both broad, broad line and narrow line radio sources. Out of 38, 20 are broad line radio galaxies, which I'm going to call them quasars for the rest of my talk and only focus on them. These agents are all low frequency radio selective. The radio selection has this advantage that it that is dominated by the emission from the radio lobes that is sometimes that sometimes can even extend beyond the host galaxy scale, and this result in little or no biases on the source's orientation. All of these sources have FR two morphology, which means that like Seagate, 
shown here, they are brightest at the edges, while FR1 sources are brightest towards the center. There is wealth of observation for this sample. We have X-ray data from Chandra to the UV optical data and IR data from Spitzer, Weiss, Herschel, multi-frequency radio data. I use this multi-wavelength data to constrain these AGN and their host galaxy properties. To do so, I used a spectral energy distribution or SED modeling. This is a CD plot for one of the quasars in my sample. The plot is in log nu L nu versus log nu space, and it extends uh, more than 10 decades from radio bands on the left to X-ray on the right. I constructed a multi-component model to fit the broadband photometry of these objects. The model accounts for um, synchrotron radiation from the jet, lobes, cores, and the hot spots. At far infrared wavelengths, it accounts for the emission from the cold dust in the host galaxy. At mid, mid infrared to near infrared wavelengths, it accounts for the emission from the obscuring torus. At optical UV bands, accounts for the emission from the accretion disk. And there is another um, underlying emission from the youngest stellar population in the galaxy at these wavelengths. So my model accounts for that too. However, the accretion disk dominates the emission at these bands since they are quasars or type one sources. At X-ray, the model accounts for the hot and soft X-ray emission from the hot corona and the accretion disk. I note that when it comes to SED analysis of these radio loud AGN, most of the studies focus on a much narrower range of data, mostly from near infrared to far infrared bands. Uh, for instance, Podikachowski et al. has studied our parent sample within this range and presented the median SED of the quasars, or you know, the broad line radio galaxies and the narrow line radio galaxies at this wavelength. So basically, broad mm, type one and type two radio loud AGN. Their plot here is in um, new L nu versus rest frame wavelength, not frequency. And the median SED of the quasars is shown in blue and the narrow line radio galaxies in pink. They found that there is a significant difference between the median SEDs of the, of the two population at near infrared wavelengths, um, which is understandable. In quasars, we can see the emission from the hot dust grains in the inner region of the torus, but we can't see this emission in type two or uh, narrow line radio galaxies. They found that this difference becomes less pronounced at mid infrared wavelengths, but it is still exists. However, going to far infrared, they found that both populations have similar normalization and shape, implying similar host galaxy properties. Why such SED models are successful within a specific range of this specific range of wavelengths, they do not take the primary source of radiation in, uh, into account, which is the accretion disk and the radio structure. To portray a full picture, there was a need for a model that could account for all these structures. So I developed a state-of-the-art AGN radio to X-ray spectral energy distribution fitting code or arc set that can model the emission from these structures. I fitted 20 quasars from the 3CRR sample at redshift of one to two with this model. And this is the best fitted model for one of the quasars in my sample. The blue component is radio, the written torus is shown in red, the accretion disk is in green, the host component is in magenta. Looking at these sources, multi-frequency radio images, I found that a single, parallel model that most people use cannot replicate the emission when multiple structures, including hot spots and bright cores are present. In general, um, the radio emission in radio loud quasars turns down when the relativistic electrons lose their energy. And this happens mostly before reaching to sublimiter wavelengths. However, this is not always the case. And this turn down can happen at larger frequencies sometimes. Um, in those cases, there could be significant contribution from this radio component, which is non-thermal at submillimeter bands. In fact, I found that there is more than 70% non-thermal emission at submillimeter wavelengths in half of my sample. This is one example, 3C270.1, um, and the non-thermal component dominates the submillimeter emission, as you can see here. This is very important um, since it shows submillimeter to even far infrared based star formation rate could be overestimated in these cases. 
Um, however, not all sources in my sample had the sublimiter data. So I recently proposed and got SMA data uh, that I will add to these SADs for better constraining the radio emission turnover. But I wanna emphasize how great this model works. Um, our team recently meant, um, got um, ALMA data for a few of these sources. And the non-thermal contribution at submillimeter wavelengths from my model is actually very consistent with what, what is resolved from ALMA. So what ArcSat can do is that <clears throat> it predicts the physical properties of the supermassive black hole and the accretion disk, including the black hole mass, mass accretion rate, the spin, the inclination angle of the accretion disk, and the properties of the torus, including the optical depth of the clouds, the volume feeling factor, among other parameters. Um, and actually, um, the torus and accretion disk parameters inferred from my fitting techniques agree very well with those in the literature for similar samples. ArcSat also estimates the properties of the host galaxy, for example, star formation rate and stellar mass, um, and another great aspect of ArcSat is that with such broad range of data and multi-component multi model, I was able to present the median intrinsic SED of radio loud quasars at redshift greater than one. This me median SED is shown in orange here, and the shaded region is the 25 and 75 percentile ranges. Um, this median SED is important because it is obtained from recent spectroscopy and photometric data, recent torus accretion disk and radio models compared to what exists in the literature. So it is significantly improved to what we have. Um, here you can see the median um, SED of the individual components and the median SED of the host galaxy. Um, this, these median SEDs are publicly available and can be used to infer the physical properties of the agent and the host galaxy. What is next for me is running ArcSat on a sample of narrow line radio galaxies in similar redshift, so I can compare the median SED with quasars and the physical properties of the, those radio narrow line radio galaxies with quasars and see if any of these quantities, for example, the host star formation rate, depends on the AGN classification as broad line or narrow line sources. Um, as I noted, ArcSat can give us the properties of the host galaxy, including the star formation rate and a stellar mass. So with those measurements, we can look into the relation of AGN activity and the host galaxy star formation activity. This relation is very important for us because it can clarify whether AGN have a positive or negative impact on their host galaxy evolution. By positive, I mean triggering more star formation and negative, I mean quenching the star formation. This is one of the questions that many studies have been trying to answer in the past 10 years, yet there is no coherent answer. Some studies find a positive um, correlation between the star formation rate and AGN luminosity, others find no correlation, some even find negative correlation between the two. The discrepancies between these results come from different AGN samples living at different redshift, the way they are identified, selection biases, the method used for star formation estimation, all of these. I addressed this question a few years ago with a large sample of type 2 X-ray selected AGN from the Primus survey. In Primus, we had a sample with 120,000 galaxies and 300 and 10 X-ray selected AGN uh, from Chandra and XMM. These sources were distributed at redshift of 0.2 to 1.2. However, to minimize the effect of redshift in um, and this correlation, I divided the sample in, through redshift, in three redshift bins. We had UV and optical data that I used uh, for estimating the host galaxies, a star formation rate uh, with SED fitting. And the plot here shows the star formation rate on the y-axis and the AGN luminosity traced by X-ray luminosity on the x-axis. Uh, for individual data point, um, the, the individual data points shown in orange and the, are shown in orange, and the green ones are the average star formation rate in bins of AGN luminosity. I did not find any statistically significant correlation between the two quantities. I investigated this relation in a MOSTEF sample too. In a MOSTEF survey, we had a sample of uh, 55 AGN identified with different techniques, including X-ray, IR, and optical methods. And they were all at redshift around 
The star formation rate of the host galaxies were estimated again from SED modeling. And, and here the plot shows the color points on, on the plots are the X-ray IR and optically selected AGN. Like, um, and rather than using the star formation directly, a star formation rate directly, I use the star formation relative to the main sequence of um, star formation and examine the relation, the relation of that quantity with O3 or X-ray luminosity as tracers of AGN activity. And I did not find any significant correlation. The sample of AGN in MOSFET and PRIMUS were moderate luminosity type two sources. So the lack of correlation may not be surprising and someone might expect this to be different in powerful quasars. So in the next step, I looked into this relation in radial out quasars from the 3CRR sample where I had the star formation rate estimation from ArcSet. Here, um, um, these are you know, all high luminosity type one sources living at the peak of the star formation and accretion activity of the universe. However, I did not find any statistically significant correlation between the two. Um, so what we find here is that if we take the effect of redshift into account, if we take the effect of a stellar mass into account, if we take the effect of aging contaminating the broadband photometry into account, it looks like there is no significant relation between the two quantities. But does this necessarily mean that there is absolutely no connection between the star formation and aging activity? Probably not. Um, aging variability play an important role in what we see here. Age and luminosity can change substantially while the star formation rate of the galaxies is stable. So variability can wash out possible, any possible relation between the two. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this, the plots I've shown indicate a lack of correlation between the two quantities in, in a statistical sense. But agent interaction with the star formation and star forming gas could be more complex than that. Radio loud agent have this advantage that um, we can use their jet length as a proxy of duration of agent activity. So longer the jet is, more mature the agent is. Now, if I go back again to these 20 radio loud quasars and look into the relation of the star formation rate estimated from ArcSed and the jet length we see a hint of a relation. In this plot, the star formation rate is on the y-axis, the jet length is on the x-axis. Um, the jet length or, you know, or the level of maturity increases as we move from left to right. It seems that mature quasars in our sample reside in galaxies with lower star formation rate than young quasars. Um, this correlation is also confirmed by other studies too. Um, to see if this is the case, I proposed and got MMT and GMOS data for a subsample of these sources in my sample um, with different jet length. With this data, I will examine the interaction of jet um, with the ionized gas in their galaxy and see if, the, um, if young jets trigger more star formation along their path. I also plan to follow up this with ALMA and see if the interaction of young or mature jets is different with the molecular gas in, in their galaxies. Um, so with that, I reached to the end of my talk. This is a, my summary slide. So we can use ArcSet and ArcSet can actually successfully um, give us the information about the uh, um, uh, properties of the AGN and the host galaxy. And it looks like that there is no direct relation between the AGN and the star formation activity of the host galaxy. Uh, but, uh, it, but at the same time, there is some hint of relation between the jet um, length or maturity and the star formation rate of the host galaxy. Thank you. Thank you, Mushgan, for a great talk. Uh, it looks like we have at least one question already from Martin. Hi. Hi, Martin. I can't see me, but never mind. Uh, okay. At some point, we should uh, separately talk about how you derive all those properties uh, of the black hole, because that's uh, puzzling to me, so I'd, I'd like to learn. But uh, okay. the other thought is the 
radio spectrum you showed is the total radio emission of the whole source or is it the nuclear emission or what? Um, so it, it depends on what the type of source that we have. So it is a whole actually. So it's... Um... So it includes the lobes and hotspots. And all. So it might be a lot of fun to try taking the core emission or even the VLBI emission and then the jet and then the hotspots and then the lobes and, and see if they correlate differently. You might, because they're looking at different time scales for one thing. Okay, yeah, that sounds, yeah. That could be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for suggesting that. Okay. Okay, we have another question from Dan Schwartz. Yeah, hi, I was wondering how uh, you consider projection effects when you're correlating the, when you're taking the length of the jet to be the uh, uh, proxy for the age. And more specifically, you know, what do you use as the jet rather than the overall uh, size of the sources? And can you get some age information from the lobes. Most of these 3C sources, uh, I believe, have uh, extended radio lobes. Uh, yeah, so the plot that I showed is actually with the um, projected um, length. That's actually a very good point. I need to the, the show, to include actually the plot with the star formation rate and the deprojected length of the jet. So that is not included, so I, I, I can, you know, I, I can plot that and show you that one later. Sorry, I, I missed the second part of your question. Well, then I was just sort of curious as what you meant by the jet. I mean, are you excluding the lobes? Or are you trying to trace the jet into the lobes? Do you always see the jet rather than just the, uh, the extended uh, uh, diffuse structures? So this is not the, this is, this, the length that I have is not including the lobe, so it's just the length of the jet. Uh, I'm not sure if I am interested. Okay, so you always see an image of the jet in the radio and you stop short of the lobes. That's, that was the question. Yeah. Thank you. And, and what about the age of the source from just the uh, uh, spectral signature of the uh, lobes? I mean, the age of the lobes as, as apart from the size. We did not think about that actually. So that's a good point. Yeah, we only use the, the, the length of the jet as, as a proxy of the age, but nothing from the lobe specifically. All right, are there any other questions? You can either raise your hand or uh, if you put something in the chat, we'll read it for you. One more from uh, Shui. Hi, uh, very nice talk. I just uh, uh, want to ask, uh, when you compare the actual luminosity and also the star formation, uh, formation rate, uh, do you assume that the uh, X-ray luminosity is pure from uh, the AGN activity, or I mean, do you consider that uh, the the jet may contribute to the X-ray luminosity? Uh, that is not actually included in in, in my model. So um, the X-ray luminosity is um, coming from the um, it's it's completely from the AGN, not the not the jet. It's completely from the equation disk, basically, not the jet. Thank you. All right, let's thank Mojgan again for another, a, a great talk, and we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mojgan. Uh, thanks, Peter, for passing the thing. Uh, all right, uh, so our next speaker for today is Dr. Georgia Donolfo who is joining us from NASA GSFC. She's been working on a wide range of research focusing on understanding energetic processes at the sun and in the heliosphere. She's also leading several instrument development efforts, including a novel neutron spectrometer, uh, the Solar Neutron Tracking Instrument, or SONTRAC. Currently, she serves as the deputy project scientist for, ACE, uh, for the ACE and STEREO missions and is the mission scientist for the IMAP mission. So please take it away. Okay, great, thank you. 
So let's see, I got to share and um, yeah. Okay, so presumably you can see the full version of the talk. Yes. So, okay, great. So anyway, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today about a topic that I'm pretty excited about, which is uh, uh, high energy gamma rays from the sun. And um, I'm gonna try to cram in a review of this subject uh, in 20 minutes. So uh, these sets of figures illustrate um, nicely what I would be focusing on for this talk, well, uh, we've known for a long time that the galactic disk uh, in the left, shown in the left here, is bright in 100 MeV gamma rays from the interaction of galactic cosmic rays with the interstellar gas. Uh, so to the right, I'm showing the gamma ray event from the sun that was detected by Fermi Lat that occurred on March 7th, 2012, and is um, actually brighter than the galactic disk. So this event was perhaps one of the most unusual events on the sun with gamma rays uh, above 100 MeV, and individual gamma rays that reach GeV energies. And this event lasted for 20 hours. Uh, so these high energy gamma ray events, which we refer to as long duration gamma ray flares, uh, have now been measured in the dozens, starting with the early observations of solar maximum mission and also with the uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. And now over the last decade, there've been uh, over 30 such events that have been detected by Fermi Lat. So the defining feature of these events um, is emission that is observed in high energy gamma rays uh, exceeding at least 50 MeV or so that can last for tens of minutes uh, to many hours. And typically the emission is delayed from the impulsive phase. And the consensus is that the emission is produced from the decay of pions um, from protons with energies greater than 300 MeV that interact deep in the solar atmosphere, not too dissimilar from the uh, way that it is produced in our galactic disk. So to illustrate the main features of long duration gamma ray flares, I'm showing here a remarkable recent example that was detected by Fermi Lat. This flare occurred on September 10, 2017 and was classified as a GOES X-class flare on the Western limb. So typically you observe short impulsive phase that includes hard X-rays and uh, gamma rays, and, it's, and I'm basically highlighting it here in red. Um, but just as this emission is uh, beginning to die down, we see uh, the onset of, a, of the gradual greater than 100 MeV gamma rays with little or no emission in other wavelengths. And so you can kind of see that here where we're blowing it up now. And what you actually see is that that gamma ray emission reaches a peak and lasts for nearly 12 hours. So an important feature of this emission is that it is characterized by smoothly decaying light curve that what one might expect from diffusive transport. Of course, as is often the case, uh, this long duration gamma ray flare was associated with a fast CME and also with a ground level enhancement uh, indicating that we had greater than 500 MeV protons released in the interplanetary medium. So the question is, what is the underlying process that gives rise to this emission? So there are two compelling theories for the origin of long duration gamma ray flares that have received a lot of attention, although that's certainly not the only scenarios that are out there, uh, but the two I'll focus on. The first scenario attributes the production of gamma rays from protons that back precipitate from a CME driven shock. Of course, we know that shocks accelerate particles to one AU. We see them as solar energetic particles and at higher energies as ground level enhancements as shown here in neutron monitors. Now the other scenario considers the injection and acceleration of particles along large coronal loops that eventually precipitate to the photosphere to produce high energy gamma ray emission. Uh, this is reminiscent of our impulsive phase but occurs on much larger coronal loops. Now pitch angle scattering from magnetic turbulence may serve to further accelerate the particles. In fact, we see evidence for large post-flare loops in H alpha that may serve as the possible structures for this acceleration, but they may not be visible in soft X-rays, making it difficult to uh, precisely model. Of course, one way to gain an understanding of the origin of these high energy flares is to look for correlations with solar contextual data on the upper panels, various studies have shown weak correlations with CME speed as well as uh, soft peak uh, X-ray intensity. Uh, there's also a, a comprehensive work by Sheridan 
that looked at dozens of long duration gamma ray flares and found that all of them were accompanied by um, impulsive greater than 100 keV x-ray emission, indicating that this early energization is somehow a necessary condition for long duration gamma ray emission. So finally, a study by Gopal Swami et al. found a correlation between the gamma ray emission and type two emission, which is an indicator of interplanetary shocks, and concluded that this was a strong evidence for a back precipitation model. So let's consider how CME origin would work more closely. There are several ways to get the emission, uh, the, uh, to envision getting those particles back to the solar surface from the CME driven shock. Uh, the first cartoon on the left here shows the shock propagating outward and accelerating particles along um, the magnetic field uh, away and to the sun. Um, so in this scenario, particles get accelerated at the flanks of the shock where they have a smaller distance to travel back to the sun uh, than, uh, than getting accelerated at the nose of the shock. But it'd be tougher to accelerate these particles uh, to high energies in part because uh, the shock speed and compression ratio are decreasing rapidly at the flanks. To remind you, um, the classic picture is that there's more efficient acceleration at the shock nose. So, however, there have been evidence to suggest that the shocks are accelerating particles at the flanks. And this is attributed in part to the more advantageous shock orientation with respect to the upstream field. So the second possibility is that protons could travel back along the magnetic field lines that intersect the shock, but wrap around it with foot points that are, um, that are tied to the sun as depicted in the cartoon here in the middle. Now the advantage here is that the protons would not have to interact with the turbulent magnetic field, but they would indeed precipitate very quickly, making it tough, however, to explain the extended duration of these flares. So finally, we can consider the scenario where particles are propagating from the shock towards the sun through the turbulent and highly diffusive region behind the shock. Um, the challenge here is that the particles would have to overcome the outward flowing plasma um, in the CME and solar wind. So one of the big concerns with the CME scenario is overcoming the mirror force as particles propagate toward the sun, um, towards that solar surface, increasing uh, with increasing magnetic field. Uh, we've conducted a recent study uh, with some of our collaborators in England using a full test, a full orbit test particle code, assuming a Parker spiral field and accounting for magnetic turbulence through pitch angle scattering. So shown on the right are the results considering an isotropic distribution of 300 uh, MeV protons. So the top panel shows the instantaneous precipitation fraction versus the scattering mean free path, considering particles that propagate down to one solar radii here in blue and 2.5 uh, solar radii in red. And the particles are released from an injection of either 20 solar radii or we consider also 70 solar radii on the right here. And then we follow the propagation of those particles for 24 hours. So you can see the increased scattering allows the protons to reach the solar surface more readily against the mirror effect. However, smaller mean free paths, um, uh, for, the, for those smaller mean free paths, the precipitation decreases against the scattering as the scattering is eventually overcome by advection of the solar wind. So really the bottom line, um, the bo well, so the bottom figure actually here is that we illustrate um, how the scattering affects the precipitation time scales. So on the left, particles precipitate quickly or rather more impulsively when we have uh, a longer mean free path. And then on the right, particles precipitate quickly um, due to the fact that the mean free path is much shorter. And so the particles then therefore take their time to reach the solar surface. So really what we've learned is that the precipitation to the solar surface is quite small uh, when accounting for the mirror effect, certainly less than 10%. Scattering does help, but it also significantly influences the precipitation time scales. And needless to say, the precipitation becomes even more challenging the further you are away from the sun. So it's possible to gain even more insight into the long duration gamma ray flares by considering the cases where we observe high energy gamma ray emission, but the associated active region appears to be behind the limb of the sun. 
And Fermi Lat observed three such behind the limb events and recent modeling of the coronal shock, which I'm showing here on this figure, uh, seems to indicate a relationship between when the field lines on the shock connect back to the visible surface of the sun and when the gamma rays be, uh, emission begins, sort of indicating a, a, a pathway back to the sun. Um, so providing compelling evidence for the CME scenario. So one of the things that we tried to take a look at was the relationship between the interacting particles at the sun, those responsible for the gamma ray emission, and the energetic particles escaping the sun as solar energetic particles. So the thinking here is that the CME is doing all, if it's doing all of the work, there might be a relationship between these two populations. Um, we estimated the contribution to the solar energetic particle population at 1 AU, accounting for the spatial distribution of the SCPs and also taking into account their transport on the way to 1 AU. And of course, we took advantage here of the high energy data from the Pamela mission. Um, for the interacting particle population, we used the estimates of Share et al, uh, where they modeled the number of interacting protons by fitting, a Fermi, uh, fitting the Fermi light curves to the predictions from a flare loop model. And so what we found was that there are huge variations in the ratio of these two populations. So for instance, looking at the May 17th and the March 7th events, you can see that while they have similar proton numbers um, at the sun, they, I mean, in space, they have very different proton numbers back at the sun. And one could envision this to be consistent with um, sporadic and unpredictable magnetic connectivity, uh, but this would be inconsistent with the extremely smoothly decaying gamma ray emission that is characteristic of these events. Also on the right vertical axis, we show the precipitation fraction or the fraction of protons that return from the shock, um, assuming that the accelerated population is derived from the shock. So for several cases, nearly 80% of the protons need to return to the solar surface to explain the gamma ray emission. So if particles are all created at the shock, this would constitute an enormous loss channel for the shock, presumably decreasing its acceleration efficiency. Now it's important to note that long duration gamma ray flare can last for a long time. So here we're showing the derived shock heights um, for times when, uh, stock heights as re with respect to the solar surface, for times when the emission is at its peak, and again, when the emission subsides to background levels. So in some cases, you see that the shock is 90 solar radii when uh, the high, emission, high energy emission begins to subside. And in fact, for the March 7th event, um, when the emission begins to subside, um, this event is already uh, at 150 solar radii from the sun. So for events like this, it's extremely challenging to efficiently get the particle back to the solar surface in the CME shock origin scenario. So as I've mentioned, an alternative scenario for the origin of long duration gamma ray flares involves particle acceleration and trapping within extended coronal loops. So the model consists of an initial injection of impulsive phase ions into a large uh, magnetic loop of length L. At the moment, we're not concerned uh, with how the injection is taking place, but one could imagine that the initial energization is occurring from the reconnection event itself or from the rising coronal shock that perturbs the loop. Particles diffuse down to the ends of the loop and precipitate in the dense chromosphere or, or photosphere. Um, but they're also could be reaccelerated um, uh, by second order Fermi acceleration to higher energies. So essentially we're considering a homogeneous uniform trap, which is of course a simplification, uh, but I think it illustrates the basic physics here. So as such, the spatial diffusion in the loops with loss at the boundaries is given by a characteristic diffusion time scale in addition to a characteristic acceleration time scale. And you note that the product of these two time scales is constant and independent of the diffusion coefficient, such that the greater the spatial diffusion coefficient, uh, diffusion, the less the momentum diffusion. And so you can kind of see the interplay between that here, uh, where uh, acceleration is uh, kind of uh, governing the, um, the transport, and then here we have escape. So we end up with the following three parameters, the injection position within the loop, 
the ratio of the spatial time scale to the acceleration time scale where the time scales are set by the varying loop length and alphane speed. And the loop length is determined by observations and the diffusion coefficient is determined by fits to photometry. So the uh, intensity of the, um, of the gamma rays as a function of time. So one event that really caught our attention was in fact this March 7th event. Uh, it was accompanied by two X-class flares. And initially it, the interpretation of this high energy emission right here was that it was a part of the impulsive phase. And then it was continued here uh, with by the uh, gradual phase. Um, but we will show that there is a different uh, interpretation here. And I just wanna say that there's a caveat here and that the interpretation of these light curves can be tricky. So our modeling efforts reveal quite a different picture. Instead of the first uh, peak being associated with impulsive phase emission, we interpret the first peak as extended emission from a small loop followed by emission from a second larger loop. The blue curve is the model fit to the first flare and is consistent with a loop size of one solar radii. And the red curve is uh, uh, the fit to the second loop with a loop size of three solar radii. And you can see that again, the interplay between spatial diffusion time scale and the acceleration time scale in these light curves. So in this case, the spatial diffusion coefficient is chosen to be the same for both loops. Uh, while other combinations of spatial diffusion coefficient and loop lengths are possible, it's clear that what you really need are large coronal structures on the order of 100,000 kilometers to, um, that are necessary to really accelerate uh, particles beyond the pion production threshold. On the upper right, we see that the centroid of the Fermi Lat emission was consistent with the flare location to within 10 degrees, but there is evidence that the source moved westward over the next several hours. Um, so in the loop scenario, this displacement of the centroid could be related to the trapping and acceleration within the second larger loop. Um, and I wanna note here that the CME, on the other hand, is nearly a half an AU away from the sun at this time. So we've also recently modeled the emission of the 2017 September 10 flare. The model results are shown in blue here, uh, where we yet again get a smoothly exponentially decaying um, uh, 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 light curve with a time constant of 6,500 seconds. Uh, this event was particularly exciting because of Owens Valley radio observations that detected not just one loop, but two loops. And you can actually identify the relevant magnetic structures here where you actually have um, the reconnection and uh, current sheet, as I'm showing here. And then the outer structure is outlined by these red lines here, indicating the presence of another much larger loop. So if we actually... Um, you know, assume a dipole configuration, the loop size is 1.4 solar radii, the loop dimension itself. So this observation is just what we needed, a reasonable measure of the loop dimension that can further constrain the trapping and acceleration model. So in the context of the Ryan and Lee model then, a 6,500 second precipitation of particles to the foot point with a loop length of 1.5 solar radii, Gives, sets the diffusion coefficient from which we then get uh, the mean free path of 200 kilometers, which is reasonable. Um, to see how much energy is in the waves that we need for this model, we can relate the diffusion coefficient to the wave field energy density, assuming a Kalmogorov form, which turns out to be 0.7 uh, ergs per centimeter cubed. And then if you compare this to the magnetic fields on, along the loop, assuming a one Gauss field at the loop top, we actually see that the turbulence is too large at the loop top. Um, and that's at a distance of about 0.4 solar radius in this case, solar radii in this case. So however, closer to the foot points, B gets larger. Um, and then we find that if we assume a B field of a 10 Gauss or so, only 18% of the ambient magnetic energy need be in the form of waves. And this situation of course improves rapidly with increasing magnetic field. So the choice of the one Gauss field reflects the quiet coronal conditions and maybe an underestimate. And in fact, recent observations have actually indicated that the loop top magnetic fields can be as high as 350 Gauss. And I also just wanna point out another study in which um, the radio observations again showed two distinct quasi-static loops of different sizes um, associated with one of the behind the limb events from Fermi 
So it's possible that to account for the behind the limb emission, you can explain it not only by the wide extent of the CME shock, but also by very large quasi-static coronal loops. So continuous cell acceleration is not um, a new uh, thing. Here I'm showing a few cases from the well-studied uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory June 1991 flares, where we do not observe a delay between the impulsive and extended phases, but rather witness a continuous and progressive acceleration. So the top figure shows the hard X-rays and the nuclear gamma ray emission at the start of the event. As the event progresses, the hard X-rays and the low energy gamma rays decrease and the highest energy channel drops down to background levels right here. So the highest energy channel does not increase again until about 10 minutes later, which is depicted by this blue line here from egret observations. Now, however, during all of this time, neutrons, which are shown as the black histogram, exhibit an initial peak in the impulsive phase and then continue to produce emission with no interruption. The gap in time between the impulsive and extended emission, taking into account the neutron production channels, is simply a result of the transition in the production cross sections. So it is clear that what we need here is a model that can explain a consistent picture in a consistent picture how we can observe such continuous acceleration with the gamma ray light curves exhibiting a smooth exponential decay. The continuous acceleration model of Ryan and Lee appears to describe many of those salient features without having to invoke an interplanetary processes such as a CME driven shock. And I also wanna point out that this is really an amazing time to be studying the sun. We've got Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter, DKIS, and an upcoming punch missions, all adding new perspectives of the sun and the heliosphere. And I have to take like a second to just advertise my instrumentation, uh, which is called SonTrack, and we'll be able to detect individual neutrons coming from the sun and hopefully shed more light on this uh, interesting high energy phenomenon. So there are definitely remaining challenges to both scenarios. In the case of the black back precipitation scenario, we need to be able to explain smooth exponential decay of the high energy gamma rays and relate this to the possible paths back to the solar surface. Of course, we also need to understand why we see such wildly discrepant numbers of particles accelerated in space and in the sun, where we sometimes need about 80% precipitation of these particles to explain the emission. And there are other inconsistencies as well, um, such as the fact that we have long duration emission when there appear to be no CMEs, and likewise, fast CMEs when there appears to be no long duration emission. So in the case of the Ryan and Lee model of trapping and acceleration, we certainly need to increase the complexity of this model. Uh, we also need to somehow maintain the wave field for hours uh, and of course better characterize the large uh, coronal loops, uh, the, the, what, what, you know, what they look like, how large they are, et cetera. Um, so I'd like to end by saying that long duration gamma ray flares are uh, one of the most uh, exciting and energetic processes at the sun. Uh, and continue to pose um, a significant challenge for modeling, uh, especially if you're taking into account the extreme energies and the, the prolonged duration of this emission. And so uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. All right, let's thank Georgia for a great talk. We can begin questions now. We already have one in the chat from Randall. Again, if you... Um, want to uh, raise your hand using the participant screen, please do that. Um, we'll start with Randall's question. Is it possible to use the models predictively to identify loops that are likely to generate LDGRF and perhaps more importantly, CMEs in general, i.e. to predict when we might be in dangerous territory for an X-class flare? Uh, I mean, that's a really good question. I think, you know, what we're using right now for prediction models, um, is uh, so the long duration gamma ray flares, you know, they may not be getting, those particles may not be getting out. Okay, that's, the, that's sort of the message of this um, talk. They may just be producing the, um, the, the high energy emission. Um, so the real concern that we usually have for space weather, of course, is the high energy, uh, the high energy particles that are escaping. And so we tend to use uh, those SCP events uh, to try to get a better prediction of uh, when they get released. For instance, um, type uh, two and type three radio emission helps us to better understand if, the, if, these, if and when these particles are being released. And so that helps us to better um, predict some of that. Uh, anyway, hopefully that helped. 
All right, we have another question from John Raymond in the chat. The turbulence of the loop suggests wave motions of order 100 kilometers per second. Per second. Is there any corresponding line broadening observed? So there, there are a couple of studies that have been done for line broadening uh, that one recently by Demortem uh, that seems to suggest the presence of these waves. So yes, um, there's, there's a lot of more work that needs to be done on that, but um, that's one of the things we're looking for, of course. That's kind of the, you know, the thing that we really need to clinch the model. <laughs> Uh, we have one from JSUB. Can you tell us about the spectrum and origin of neutron flux? Oh, well, the neutrons are interacting, you know, with a threshold above, you know, 10 MeV or so, uh, just the way the gamma rays are. So they will, um, the, the protons that are traveling along the loop length will interact in the photosphere and produce, um, you know, all these, uh, all these neutrons um, all the way up to, you know, 100, 150 MeV or so. Um, and you know, they decay over time, you know, so there's a 15 minute decay time between, you know, trying to get them from the sun to one AU. So we tend to just see the neutrons that are very energetic at one AU. So the idea would be to send uh, a, a spacecraft closer to the sun, like Parker Solar Probe. And, and in fact, there was, um, a, you know, there was a proposal to put a neutron spectrometer on that mission. Um, but there are other opportunities such as inner heliosphere CubeSats where we can look at the low energy counterpart of those neutrons. So um, yeah, so there's, I mean, but they, they can be quite prolific. I mean, they're, they are uh, difficult to detect, you know, frankly, but uh, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory uh, was able to detect them in all the series of June, 1991 flares that they observed. And occasionally we see um, direct solar neutrons with neutron monitors. We still have time for more questions, if anybody has some. If not, let's thank both of our speakers for a couple of great talks and uh, look forward to seeing the rest of you next week. Thank you. <laughs>